Greetings, you've landed at the VUC, IP Communications and VoIP Community. We would like to thank Simwood.com for their support. Simwood can turn you as a developer into a telco. Our host at PBX is from OnSIP.com. You can go to GetOnSIP.com for a URL people can click to call you. We've been privileged over the last five years to be using the best conference bridge on the planet. Yes, I'm talking about ZipDX.com, full color, full featured, full HD conference bridge. Our website, VUC.me on the web, is hosted by Bluehost.com. And our worldwide local rate dialers are from Voxbone. And here we are <laughs> with a total blackout. DDoS! It's DDoS! Somebody is attacking the VUC. I don't know what happened, but I've got so many different clients and videos on that uh, we'll have to, yes, down, thumbs down. Anyway, we're going to uh, be talking to uh, our good friend Dave Todd in just a second, but I'm going to, and you can watch the, you can see the, hopefully, see the uh, title, which is Benchmark, Bocotonism, Make Wi-Fi Fast, TCP BBR. And we are going to get to that in just a second. But first, I don't know why that video didn't show, but like I said, I've got 15 different clients running. Let's take a look at my Wi-Fi tool uh, to just get a flavor of some of the things that we're going to do here. So this is something that I downloaded just today. It's a freeware from a company whose name I've already forgotten because I'm <laughs> that kind of thing. But anyway, this is to introduce Dave because Dave is big time on we on Wi-Fi. Plus, I switch between French and English from time to time. Wi-Fi and Wi-Fi. So here we are. We got the radar running, uh, and we Dave asked me a question a little while ago. Which is better? Is it better to be f minus fifty or minus one hundred? I'm going to turn it over to Dave, and he's going to explain to us what this radar thing means. That's Dave? Good, to see. good to see you all today. I'm actually going to take a quick poll. I'll leave the radar up. We oh. have James uh, uh, Bodie here and Tim and Andy. Um, and I'm Andy's already answered this question. Uh, but, James, which do you think is better, minus 50 or minus 100? Uh Minus 50 is uh, a larger signal because it's negative. So the, no, is that right? So uh, the, the larger the negative number, the smaller the signal. That's right, isn't it? How about you, Tim? Um, you can go too strong. So surely yes. the right answer is somewhere in the middle. Damn, you got to say that. I, you're the first person to get that one right. Yes, minus 50 is the strongest single possible, and that may overdrive the receiver. And ideally, in Wi-Fi, you're typically aiming for minus 60 through minus 70 as being an ideal range. Trick um, question. Trick yes, question. Yes, it was. But so many people don't even get that portion of the question. Yeah, well, I, it, for a bonus mark, a compensation one, can I explain intermodulation pro products? Probably not. You don't want to do that. <laughs> Non-linearities non -lin in the front end of your radio receiver. But there. <laughs> <laughs> well, that basically, t I have three things I want to talk about today, and that we just started with ties directly into the problem I've been having in explaining difficult, abstract, electrical engineering concepts to the typical user, or to bosses, or to anyone, really. And I'm in the process of, of finalizing a, a talk at Linux Plumbers thing about all the great stuff we just did with Wi-Fi, and struggling tremendously with how to explain it. And uh, uh, signal strength is one of them. A lot of people write off the problems in Wi-Fi to, oh, it's interference, or Wi-Fi has always been like that. But we've made a really big dent in the queuing portion of how we do Wi-Fi, and that turns out to be one of the biggest problems it actually had. I'm going to get to that later. In terms of words and concepts I've been struggling with, um, how many of you have ever read any Kurt Vonnegut? And it's a yes all around. I, didn't, I was too busy trying to share a, a window. Um, well, years ago, he came up with a uh, fictional religion called Lokananism, uh, which is defined as harmless untruths. 
And basically the entire religion is informed entirely of lies. But if you believe in all those lies, you'll be happy. And uh, everyone tells pretty lies to everyone else until everyone believes in them. And then everybody dies and the world ends. And I'm struggling with trying to find ground truth in ways of explaining, for example, the signal strength question we had earlier. And I've been working on this buffer blow thing for a long time. I'm trying to explain that more bandwidth does not mean your system's faster. And uh, recently I started getting back some results from the latest and greatest generation of the new high, high speed, super fast internet. And it's cool, except that what happens is that they run really fast for 50 seconds or 22 seconds, if you look at these slides. And then suddenly uh, the Google Fiber one here hits over 1,000 milliseconds of latency. Hmm. The uh, Comcast one, over 200. Even though you're getting 200 megabits down, I, we hit those enormous latencies, even on the latest and greatest stuff. And I've been trying to fix that stop that from happening but how do you explain to someone that once you have a thousand seconds of latency for each individual packet sorry a thousand milliseconds what happens um, what 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 should you reason from that and that's an open question for the audience I mean what does your gut say to you and oh my god my really fast connection is now I've got a second worth of latency in it what does that mean well, something's um, causing it to slow down, so probably in a buffer somewhere. Oh, yes. But what does it mean in terms of your application performance? Oh, it's terrible. Oh, yeah, terrible? Yeah, it depends on what the application is. But if it's something that's uh, interactive, which is re requires a, uh, an acknowledgement back, it's going to crawl, isn't it? It's going to absolutely crawl, yeah. To give you an example, I did a benchmark earlier where I had a second's worth of latency on downloading Slashdot. Okay, this is Colin what geek site. Let me, let me get let me get my face back on the screen here. Um, oops, that probably wasn't it. Let's try that. Oh, there we go. Hi again. So um, a download of Slashdot um, under the workload that was um, normally uh, without a workload was about eight seconds in this particular benchmark. Um, that's a long time, but it was there. Um, with a second's worth of induced latency, how long does your gut say that that download should take? Well, gut feel is one second longer than it would otherwise. Well, but, no, no, that, that's but not that is case. not true. Yeah, it's it's, 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 it's going to be a factor of about 100, isn't it? It depends on how many interactions there are. And it, something like a complicated page you're going to have lots and lots of interactions. And if each one takes a second, then that's going to dramatically slow the thing down. Well, it depends on whether they're queued or not. So, I mean, I'm guessing that some a factor of somewhere between 10 and 100 times slower than the, um, than, than the original. Okay, so I see 10 and 100. Um, that's a big range there, too, but, you know, okay. Yeah, well, I don't see what um, I don't know is whether the page led 10 things if you build a page right, you can have 10 connections going in parallel, or if you build it wrong, you can have them in sequence. So until you know about the page, you can't tell which of those cases you're in. That's good. Anyone else want to uh, venture a number that their gut tells them in that case? Well, it really depends on the page. So go on, put us out of our misery, Dave. Tell us. Tell us. And that particular benchmark, it, took two, it went from 8 seconds to 230 seconds to download the page. So your, your, your ratio is about right, let's say it's 10, roughly 23 times longer with that, with one second worth of delay. And I've been, and I only just realized really um, that when I start talking about, ooh, we have the round trip time on the queuing here and how excited I get about that, that wow, you know, if we have that time, what actually happens? And the effects of reducing round trip time are exponentially higher than uh, you know that so when I say something takes a second of latency now for each round trip um, 28 times worse <laughs> um, so I don't know how to express that uh, I could just say that oh this is better or this is massively better um, but I don't 
how can you communicate that gut feeling to, I don't know, Hillary Clinton um, or to somebody else? Anyone? Raise your hand. So, the, so the experience is not unlike um, dropping back to 2G. 2G on most modern phones is data is unusable because all of the apps are attempting to use to use it and you end up with like 15 seconds of queue um, and it's not that like any one of them could probably just about be usable but like when you have all of them there it turns out to be unusable um, in my experience so it's um, so for a for a for Hillary Clinton, I think that's the argument you say. It's like falling back to 2G. <laughs> okay. Uh, that might be a way of putting it, but uh, later in my talk today, I'm going to point at how can I, make, I can make 2G usable again. I really can. You see, but James wants to kill it, so. Well, well I only want to kill it because we, there are so many things we can do that are actually better, but Tim wants to grasp onto 2G. So you better tell us how to make 2G go better because they, uh, because uh, Tim wants to use it for the next five years. <laughs> so um, the other part about benchmarking is that for me, benchmarking involves, try, as an engineer, involves trying to find the ground truth and optimizing for a better product. And uh, this is Ham. Ham works in marketing and public relations. Oh yeah, I can I can do that. I'll do that in a second. Um, he's really really good with the turn of phrase like ultra fast broadband. You know where I do things. FQ cuddle. Yeah, ultra fast broadband. And uh, he's immoral. He'll sell anything. You know everything's great with a Chesterfield. And so he's kind of been my nemesis my whole life. And oh thank you, honey. My coffee from. Does everyone say hi to Lorna. Hi. Hi to Lorna. <laughs> <laughs> and I, he goes out and sells bandwidth, 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 bandwidth. Um, and I, I, I'm going to probably use him in my, he's cute as hell, you know, but I, I need to keep him under control because bandwidth isn't the whole story and so on. So I'm going to start talking about uh, the work we've been doing on Make Wi-Fi Fast in a second. But it comes down to figuring out a way to express simple ideas, fundamental truths that aren't a religion without coming across like a monkey. Um, <laughs> so I'm going to put up another slide here. Let me do this. While you're, while you're working on that, Dave, uh, one of our regulars, Corrado, uh, posted this. And if you can, I'm sure you can see it, hopefully. And it's the DSL reports uh, of his uh, setup. And you can see the buffer bloat is A, quality A+, plus, et cetera. Good for him. Yeah, that's a good buffer bloat um, and, score. As you oh. know, uh, my ISP free, uh, whenever I do the test, it's always uh, A+, plus, A+. Plus. But of course, I don't use Wi-Fi generally. <laughs> well, one of the things I'd encourage that poster to do, well, is he actually running with any of the, anti the buffer blood fighting technologies? And secondly, run the test for longer. It took a long, once you get this amount of bandwidth, it just, your, most of the benchmarks end before you start hitting buffer blood. Mm -hmm. um, so that's a core point. You know, again, a benchmark runs for 30 seconds, but you use your internet all day long. Exactly. So get that problem so let's see here can people see this one I see it just so everybody sees it okay so this is a uh, Linux stock Wi-Fi driver for the ath 9k today or Linux 4.4 which is more or less a year old and at the lowest rate in this particular case this is the 5 gigahertz so it's 6 megabits running at 6 megabits I'm getting over a thousand milliseconds of latency this is common across, if it was running uh, one megabit, it'd be, oh, sorry, a thousand mil, yeah, so it'd be also be six seconds of latency if it was running at one megabit, 2.4 gigahertz. And this is, happens to Wi-Fi all the time. At the highest rate, MCS 15, you might see 20 or 30 milliseconds, but as the, um, the rate goes down, the latency goes up. It's an intrinsic relationship between the two. And 
uh, what we've managed to achieve, although this slide is messed up, is that at each rate today from 6 megabits to uh, 100 megabits, these uh, messed up things in here, uh, what happened is I had a bunch of outliers that were about three seconds long due to something called power saving Wi-Fi. But the reality uh, ended up, I'll have another slide that shows it, that we've managed to have less than 12 milliseconds of induced delay across the entire range. Um, I go back to trying to explain this stuff. We've got all these other videos out there uh, by all these people, including Van Jacobson here on the right, Kathy Nichols on the left, a fellow by the name of Stephen Hemminger here, Vince Cerf, Jim Gettys, myself, Eric Dumas, lots of people that are famous. But, you know, most of the time, let me uh, go back here, turn this off. Most of the time, even with those kind of people here, I don't know how people can distinguish between me and the monkey. And the reason for the fire me or benchmarks or anything else is uh, kind of tough. So what other methods could I be using to effectively make an argument that, oh, by the way, we cut latency from over a second to 10 milliseconds and have people believe me and understand deep in their gut that I just cut I just improved the performance of something so much that it's it's unbelievable. You know, factor of 20, factor of 50, depending on what you're using as a benchmark. On the other hand, I think it would be a good idea to talk about the things that make a difference in latency. I mean, if you're downloading the latest Batman movie, you don't care about the latency. True. Probably you're doing it on a tour anyway, <laughs> a tour in anyway, so you don't True. know anything about that. But the point is, uh, what are the things? So video conferencing is one. And by the way, um, yeah. I'm almost always out of sync, as you notice, Dave. And I don't know why that is, but it probably certainly has something to do with latency between me and my ISP and Google. And uh, my ISP is at war with Google somehow, so I don't even know how that factors in. Anyway, Tim was going to say something. I was going to say two things, one of which is that the people who care most about uh, latency these days are the gamers. Like they, they, them and, and the guy we had on about a year ago who was trying to do um, distributed uh, band practice. Like he cared, he, of all the people I've ever spoken to apart from Carl Fife, he was the man who cared most about latency. Um, like, you know, his software would check if you had more than... 30 milliseconds, it said, basically, you can't do this. Um, you know, forget it. There's no point. I've, I've forgotten what the number was. It was some, uh, somewhere between 30 and 50 milliseconds. He said, if you get more than that to, to between your band members, then forget it. Yeah, that's right. a good point. 30 would be ideal, and you can't get better than 30, no matter you almost have to be in the next room, in which case, why aren't you just rehearsing in the same room? Uh, you're right. Uh, 50 is already stretching it. So the speed of light, you know, being as we can't change that, that is a big problem. But uh, so his, his thing, yeah. I mean, for, for Dave's point of view, for information, his thing was if you've got members of a band who live in the same town but don't necessarily, aren't necessarily able to get to the same practice room, they could use his software to practice right. and still be, like, really well in sync. And so he was really, I can't remember the name of the product, um, Jam Kazam, you're talking. That's about. right. Yeah. So well, he, also the he can. He can. Well, there's another thing you can do, which is if you play stuff like Tangerine Dream, it doesn't matter how what the <laughs> is because you just. Anyway, own Randy, a... taking you to task, you can change the speed of light by uh, by choosing the medium through which you push it. So um, there's a market for ultra low latency transmission. Um, which uses terrestrial radio relay as opposed to fiber. The reason that um, this works better is because radio goes faster, propagates faster than light through fiber. Indeed it does. And Dave uh, hooked us up with someone who's going to be a guest very soon. Dave, uh, remind me who that is, but they're working on some very strange radio links. It's called Free Space Optics. His right. Name is Luca, he goes by the nickname of Musty. Uh, it's been, he's got a really cool thing called Carusa, and uh, 
he was just here in San Francisco showing it off. And but what what is know, it? Well, what does it, uh, it do? Well, it's called Caruza. You can go looking for it there. Basically, he takes um, an SFP adapter and he just uses it as a laser. And he has some very precision aiming mechanisms that let you have two boxes up to 150 meters away that uh, just beam the laser. So you can beam the laser across the street to another portion of campus and get a gigabit, the testing 10 gigabit now out of it. Um, so no need to string fiber, no need to use Wi-Fi. And that's November 11th, by the way, for those of you who are interested in that. This how, is how do you spell Caruza, very quickly? K-O-U, sorry, K-O-R-U-Z-A, K-O-R-U-Z-A dot com. James, yeah. the rest so of the K-O-R, U-Z-A for the rest of the world. They're ramping up for early manufacturing and looking for beta testers. Um, that, and uh, it's a cool start. <laughs> I'm, I'm excited about that technology, particularly if they can continue to improve the aiming mechanism. Almost as excited as I was about Wi Fi back in 1998. Uh, it solves a lot of problems no interference, um, solid gigabit. Um, I like it. I like the potential in it a lot. <laughs> So I, look, I will probably not make the next talk, but Luke is an entertaining fella, and I hope you guys have a good time. Okay, and I, just to be clear, because Jay Carpenter helped me out here, it isn't caruza.net, it's, it's uh, com, it's .net. So it's K-O-R-U-Z-A dot net. Uh, check that out. It's really interesting. I appreciate you uh, turning me on to that, Dave, because we'll be with us November 11th. All right, back to Dave. Okay, so it clearly identified three places where latency matters on the internet, musical collaboration, and by the way, I'm a duffer. I gotta stand right next to the drummer. So four milliseconds, eight milliseconds is the max I can stand. <laughs> um, the other one that everyone identifies is um, video conferencing and VoIP, and that's sort of why I'm on this show, is that I really care that my lips sync up, and it's not, and to kill you, and so on, you know, that, that we are able to communicate uh, well. And there's a wonderful uh, video out there that shows what happens. It's called Living with Lag. And it, what they do is they use a VR helmet and then put video into it and have people try to function with a half a second of lag. It's funny as hell. <laughs> um, and so there's the gamer market. So you all miss one of the most important ones, Web pages. You click on something and you want something to happen. <laughs> um, so, uh, if you have a second, I already used the example earlier. You have a second worth of lag on your on your link. A web page downloads, tw web page downloaded twenty three times slower. Three, you know, th two, two minutes and thirty six seconds. So it's almost three, a really long time, almost four minutes on that particular link which is, of course, much longer than your attention span, unless you're in the cat videos. Um, there's a couple other places where latency does matter as well on the Internet, but those are the top four. Um, we have invented all kinds of great ways to mask latency. For example, your typical app will download stuff in the background. You'll get your email in the background. So it doesn't matter as much. But those are huge markets. I would like gaming to work, video conferencing to work, et cetera. And that's sort of why I've been working on making Wi-Fi work better. Because normally when I'm doing a video conference, I'm in bed or lying, you know, sitting somewhere. Um, and don't want to be in front of the device. So that's what we've been working on. So to move back to my Prezo a little bit. Uh, the Make Wi-Fi Fast project, I've been working on this for about three years. We've already solved buffer bloat on everything else. And uh, on DSL and cable, et cetera, you're able, and free, for example, shipping it by default, you're able to run an algorithm called FQ Cuddle, and that makes your latency low no matter what you're doing. But applying it to Wi-Fi turned out to be hard. It took two years. And we just finished doing that about two months ago, and presenting the work. Uh, in about a week. So I wanted to bring up another portion of the Prezo here. Let's see here. Where'd it go? There it is. Um, this is your typical Wi-Fi test bench. Um, 
one of the companies paying attention to the work that we're doing is Candela Tech, and this is theirs. They have, um, I, I gotta give them a plug, they're paying attention, they're building better tools, and they're doing good testing, and I'm really appreciative of them. There's two other companies in the Wi-Fi testing field I've heard of that aren't. Um, and over here on the, on, on the left here is your typical setup with lots and lots of stuff over the air, and over here on the right here is what's called an isolation box. And there's a ton of stuff in there, attenuators, the devices under test, uh, other kinds of controls and so on. But going back to you guys, what do you think is wrong with this setup? If you were to test Wi-Fi, what would you not learn from this? Am I unmuted? Yeah. I think one of the problems is you've got too much RF floating around there. So you're going to have all kinds of um, interference um, third order intermodulation products and things like that, which will completely screw up your results. Is that right? That's pretty good. That's a that's a definitely one flaw, that level of density. Anybody else? Well, I don't know if you'd count it exactly the same, but if you, you look talking about equipment under test, you don't usually have on Wi-Fi umpteen devices in exactly the same area. They are distributed. Very good. Anyone else? I wouldn't have had chosen to put them on racked metal shelving. <laughs> okay. Well, um, you know, you can get an approximation of what you're aiming for from all these things, but you're also dead right um, in that no matter how good even your isolation box and your isolation tests are, let me see if I can find this one. I have a list of the things here. Is that in that box and in that room are not an emulation of what Wi Fi is actually used in? Here's a nice long distance thing. This is archive.org's roof down the street from me. Coffee shop, a bunch of people spread throughout the room on an airplane or in a hotel or, you know, I'm kind of infamous, but my, my, my retreat is this yurt in the middle of the woods with a long distance Wi-Fi connection to the universe. Um, so inside of that box or inside of that room, the odds of you actually getting a result that's going to actually be applicable here are not as good as you might like. <laughs> and what we've been focusing on, like Wi-Fi Fast Project, is we're trying to come up, let me see if I can find the right thing here, come up with metrics other than bandwidth that think about these sort of environments with benchmarks, with the hope that people will understand what the benchmarks mean and, uh, and build a better Wi-Fi system. So we do things, long duration tests, varying RTTs, distance, packet captures. And we don't just test for bandwidth. We test for bandwidth and latency. So recently, the Ask10K guys uh, were doing some work on improving this particular brand new hyper fast, super fast, 802.11 AC driver. And did a test like this one. This is using a tool that we use called Flint. Um, and they broke Flint. They tried to start 100 flows simultaneously in this test, uh, or one flow to 100 stations. And what actually happened was that five or so, I don't know what it is, I think it was five flows got started up successfully, and the tool reported, yay, to 20 megabits average during the first 100 uh, portion of the test. And the other 95 flows never started at all. So the other 95 stations are sitting there twiddling their thumbs. <laughs> and then a little bit later in the test, those flows ended. The test was only supposed to be 800 milliseconds long. A bunch more flows got started, and then those ended. And then a couple more got started, and then the test timed out because it has a built-in three-minute 300-second timeout here. And so the net report, the final number from this, was we got an average of 20, meg uh, 20 megabits, uh, which was impossible, <laughs> but believable. And simultaneously, this test also measured latency, and uh, the first person to test the latency grew for these attempted stations to almost 20 seconds on the last little bit of your link. So... Uh, when you're trying to measure things like TCP, uh, the average doesn't make any sense. You kind of need to check to see if you're actually doing what you thought you did. 
And you should never look at summary numbers. A plot like this one um, happens all the time. And yet what happens to me is I get people, oh, we changed this thing here, and we got a TCP throughput of this. And uh, was it here? <laughs> or was it here? How many flows was it? There's all these other potential problems in Wi-Fi that Ethernet doesn't have. As one of you pointed out, multipath is a problem. There's also more than one kind of device. People think UDP and TCP are equivalent. Really big test in the Wi-Fi industry, and I'm pretty sure in the LTE industry, is something called rate over range, where you get this chart back of every possible uh, combination of ranges you care about that has one number for each of these things that might have had a graph that looked like that rather than anything same. The work we've been doing, same test, different driver. This is a beautiful graph. Um, it looks like I've made Randy laugh. I don't know why he's laughing. Well, yeah, I was laughing because James yawned and got the full video. <laughs> no, I didn't. I didn't. I, honestly. I really wanted to. I didn't yawn. I just went. Yeah. It was, um, yawn. It was a look of amazement. But it made a noise. Uh, I, I wanted to interject this thing since I'm already now did have done that. I want to mention something, which is that you can be argued that um, when cell phones first came out, they made VoIP look good because everybody's like the quality of a phone call was so horrible that it became like VoIP, right, in the beginning. And I think the same thing is happening with Wi-Fi from my own experience. And I, I'm just a user, right? And when I'm out and about, I've got like LTE and I may have three or four bars, but it still takes forever for stuff to come up. So the latency from my point of view if i'm on a train or if i'm in paris which is you know you got great lte but there's seven million people on it so you're not going to get much activity so my point is that there's always going to be this problem until we have some perfect technology that permeates the entire uh, urban structure or perfect technology that permeates the not urban the rural structure so that you're getting something on a train, I can tell you that I barely had phone coverage this time. And usually, um, there's at least a little, there, the phone is usually constant. And uh, it might be um, the H plus or occasionally an edge, believe it or not, still exists. Haven't seen G for a while. <laughs> but my point is that it's all relative. So hard to say. I mean, in my wandering, I'm happy to have a signal of any kind. Yeah, well, we started off with low standards. I'm curious, what were you reacting to, James? Were you yawning or were you... Um... No, no, I was, I, I was looking at the uh, the graph and going, oh, my God, what's that? It looked oh. as though somebody's just taking a crayon and going... <laughs> so uh, I, I think what you're trying to show us is a graph that people look at and go, wow, that's complicated. <laughs> well, good point. I'll put it back on the screen in a minute. I wanted to talk to uh, Randy's portion earlier. Early Wi-Fi had much better VoIP characteristics than present day Wi-Fi by a huge margin. Why was <laughs> uh, that? And, and, That's fascinating. And things like Skype just worked and they were better and VoIP was better. And it's kind of hard to remember far that far back, but uh, Skype sounded great compared to phones. Um, and the reason for that was because of less queuing delay. Um, we had four packet buffers in those days. So you were pretty much guaranteed you would always get a packet in under 20 milliseconds. Uh, today, over a second of jitter is possible, six seconds of jitter is possible, and that's partially what's been messing up VoIP and so on. Um, I've done some tests, go ahead. Yeah, no, I was just gonna say on, on, on that note, what some of the WebRTC stuff is actually really seriously stressing Wi-Fi. Um, we, um, we, we used to do some testing in a company I was working with where you'd make a, a, a mesh call between several, like so maybe there'd be six of you in a in a WebRTC setup and you were trying to, to test this mesh call. So that would be, um, I can't remember, so that's probably 30 connections uh, needing to go up. But given the, the way that WebRTC works is it tries to, um, tries to, 
try various different paths so that there's probably a couple of interface possible interfaces for each so like you're up to about a hundred attempts at, at pairings of packets and they all come up simultaneously because somebody says ring this group call and suddenly you get a couple of hundred packets from five or six different devices all whacking the Wi-Fi and basically it drops most of them and and so you end up with this super unsatisfactory experience that some people actually never get connected because although your aggregate bandwidth is plenty and in theory once the thing settles down it'll be fine the kind of startup discovery phase fails miserably because the Wi-Fi has no clue what to do with it because it's not been optimized for that um, and, and I don't see that being fixed um, anytime soon either I would regard it as mostly fixed as of a few months ago, at least okay. on the software I'm working on. Cool. It might, it might not scale to 30. I would love it if you could repeat that sort of testing um, with the software that we have now or so on. And I'll talk about why we've solved that in a bit. Um, but yeah, OK. So can I go back to my little my little really hard to explain graph? And Absolutely. Well, well, go on. I want to see you explain this. So, I, you know, I want him to do that and explain it for me. I really do. Um, oops, sorry, he, he just played an E flat. Let's put him over there. Great. So I'm going to put this back up. I wish I had a way of. I, I like actually me, me, my hands waving around in front of the slide, um, but I don't know how to do that. So we need to put you a, a little screen in screen, don't we? You need cam twist. Yeah. Okay. And you can do the twist. Let me go back to the first graph, okay? So here I am trying to talk to a 100 station simultaneously. Only five flows manage to start up, giving me a bandwidth of about 100 megabits total, 20 megabits average. And all the others got starved, much like uh, what Tim just described. They all got starved out, okay? Same test, new software. Using FQ Coddle plus what's called airtime fairness, all 100 flows manage to start simultaneously to all the stations. And they all share fairly. So all of them in this particular cast are getting one megabit each to each of the stations. So, uh, yeah, it's colorful. It shows 150 milliseconds worth of latency as well, because it's hard, Wi-Fi is like that. We can actually reduce that more, but still. Um, that's 100, how many people do 100 stations on Wi-Fi? Not many. And so we've just gone to, from something where 95% of the people were starved out completely to where everyone's getting roughly an equal percentage of the bandwidth with only 150 milliseconds latency. In this particular thing. Me, I look at that beautiful plot of all the stuff really close together and I dance. But James. No, I'm looking at it thinking, well, uh, just for those people who are listening in audio uh, only, what we're looking at now is what is a good graph. And the reason it's good is because there's an awful lot of stuff going on in there, uh, as opposed <laughs> to the bad graph where it kind of ramped up at the beginning and then went into nothingness. So this, which looks a bit like a, um, a piece of paper where, where somebody's gone mad with a, a bunch of multicolored crayons, uh, <laughs> is actually a good graph. Thank you, James. I, I, I think it's a good graph. The density is so wonderful. The, the, the sharing is nearly perfect. Everyone's getting service in 150 milliseconds or less. And I don't know how to, Get, describe why this is so much better, except for. Well, the clearly, there's a lot more going on in there. But, a lot know, more going on. Yeah, about okay. you know what I've got a, an even better way of of making things work better. You know what that is? Don't, Don't use Wi-Fi. Use LTE, and it'll <laughs> spank the Wi-Fi every time. Well, I think that LTE in a, with 100 stations in a highly dense area might act up. I don't know what level of testing that has been done with a cell in a 20-foot space. Uh, um, well, I think the new 5G super dense stuff actually works extremely yeah. well. Okay. Um, but the larger so can I have a free license to run that then, James? So I wave my magic, <laughs> magic wand and make that happen, Jim. And, uh, 
Uh, and I'll, I'll, uh, I'll make it open source so that you can run it on your own Lime Microsystems SDR platform as well. Yeah, um, I'm looking forward to being able to play with small cells. But I want to point out that all these algorithms do apply to LTE, 5G, et cetera, and that we can probably make them better. Yeah. LTE's got some good stuff at layer two, but it isn't, from what I've seen so far, they haven't done the advancements in Q theory that we've applied to Wi Fi. Okay. I've got a little question for you before I forget, because I'm getting old sure. and, I, and I forget questions. What's the effect of introducing um, diff serve tags into this equation? Because I'm gonna, no, no, yeah, normally um, you, you, you'd actually tag all your high priority traffic like VoIP and, and um, other bits and pieces of high priority with diff serve. So, uh, so they go first. Very, very good point. And I'm skipping ahead on the Prezo. Um, the answer is that with better scheduling, at least with Wi Fi and the FQ Cottle algorithm, we don't need hardware support for, for VoIP. Uh, we won. We won big. Uh, we actually can just do it with best effort. No explicit classification with diff service required. This particular graph, by the way, I was only not aware that there's people listening rather than watching. Um, this particular graph shows what uh, Linux looks like today with really terrible, um, how, how would you, exp uh, James, how would you explain what a mean opinion score is? Um, it's how how good the audio sounds, how legible it is, legible, or how, how, how you can decode it in your head. Why does it go from zero to five and go like zero to 11? I, <laughs> I've got no idea. Some, some Burke thought it up. And, 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 and the useful range is from about kind of three to 4.6, isn't it? It's not as if it's Kind of meaningful. Everything's kind of scrunched into a little little area. Yeah, basically anything above three is pretty good, and anything above four is very good. Um, you have to be a really sensitive listener to hear and hear anything yeah, above. Like four. us, of course, we're 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 very high definition, uh, wide band sensitive people. Yes, yeah, so I, I can certainly. I mean, someone's typing right now. Stop it. Anyway. Um, so what I'm trying to show with this graph is that the state of Linux Wi-Fi today, although there are some commercial manufacturers that are already doing some of this stuff, we got a one without classification on the MOS score. Totally unusable. Um, if we use diff serve classification, it goes to a four. It's cool. We improved that two years ago a little bit. Um, but what just got, went into uh, OpenWRT, also called lead is that we are now capable of having a quality VoIP call at a 4.3 something MOS score. Uh, and the new stuff is more, even more robust to having more and more stations available and provides more bandwidth while simultaneously doing it. In other words, for VoIP, not, maybe not video conferencing, uh, we can uh, obsolete treating voice separately um, today. Which is cool because diff serve, as you're probably well aware, is not preserved across internetwork boundaries. This particular call, is well, not yeah, it's not, not guaranteed to be, but in some cases it is, isn't it? I've you only can, you can sneak it across. Inside of a corporation, I've seen it work. Um, as soon as you try to go outside your corporation, yeah. it's game over. Yeah, that's true. But uh, in most cases, the majority of problems you get are at the local end. Typically, um, as you quite rightly point out, over the Wi-Fi. Yes. So, but we've got it fixed. It's glorious. This has yeah. really been really, really awesome. Um, and uh, we've gone from three years ago, we shipped an open WRT. This particular benchmark under these typical circumstances, we were only able to get 15 megabits um, while doing a VoIP call to where we're actually able to get 45 megabits, three times better, while doing a VoIP call. And by not using the special classifications required for VO, we got an extra 10 megabits and the same MOS score. I'm happy. I was dancing. Uh, <laughs> it's good stuff. Yeah, do you know which codec were, were, were being used in these tests, just out of interest? Uh, I'm sorry. I'd have to go look at the actual benchmark. We use yeah, because it's not getting very much over about, what, 4.3. So it's not going to be a super duper modern codec. No, I, I, but you are, you, we should definitely try something really high end um, uh, on that. Um, 
So long as the typical packet size is less than 300 or 400 bytes, I don't see these numbers changing. Um, and the typical packet size for VoIP at low quality, uh, GSM is like 120 bytes. So um, if you can suggest a good codec for us to run, rerun those tests with, I'd be glad to do that. Well, the obvious choice is Opus, isn't it? Well, that's a good choice, but is it the obvious one? Well, I think so, because it's probably the, the, the best modern codec that's floating around at the moment. Well, uh, just as a dumb question, what are the 5G guys going to use? Uh, they're using AMR wideband. Uh, and then there's the, there's a new uh, 3GPP codec, which begins with an E, and I can't even remember it, but um, nobody's using it at the moment. Um, so wh why would 5G go with yet another codec? Just because uh, they patents? Well, yeah, it's a, it's a very, very good question. And uh, it's because of 3 gpb and and represented on the standards uh, committees by uh, representatives from places like Nokia and Ericsson and places like that who have to, they, they come up with these codecs, don't they? So, they, uh, it's just a way of keeping patent lawyers employed. I, th I, th I think you're right there. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's called EVS, by the way. EVS, Thank that's you. the one. What does it stand uh, for? Extra voice something. Enhanced voice services. All right. Thank you. Uh, I'm, I'm certain that having enhanced voice services is very important to the LTE industry, considering how bad voice is these days. Yeah, well, but why don't they just use Opus like kind of the rest of the uh, IETF world? I, I, I like Opus a lot. I'm really impressed with it, particularly, um, you know, I can carry transport music with 2.7 milliseconds latency with it. Um, as a short haul transport. It's good. Um, yeah. So uh, not my call. I, I, I'm yeah. a great believer in simplicity and so on. Yeah, and what I really like about it is what, how it performs when you get it into an errored uh, environment. So you're dropping packets left, right, and center, and it's still cranking through um, with a high MOS, MOS score. It's brilliant. But anyway, sorry, I, we digress. Yes. Oh, I blew your mind, though. Got to try this stuff. We've made Wi-Fi work a lot better for VoIP. Um, I'm both ahead and aside of myself, and I'm not sure if I need to explain this. So, anyone has anyone ever heard of the Wi-Fi performance anomaly? It's actually called that if you Google for it. The Wi-Fi performance anomaly. It was uh, figured out in 1980. Sorry, 2003, 2003 or so. Now, basically what happens with Wi-Fi, not, not LTE, is that um, a slow station bogs down everything else. Your slowest station in a given area will slow everybody down around it. It will grab more airtime. Now, LTE is already, LT, um, was, was as I looked, was already airtime fair, ATF. Um, and what we've done for starters was to first get rid of FIFO queuing. We then added FQ coddle to things. We then added FQ very close, um, FQ call very, very, very close to the Wi-Fi, so we have a really tight feedback loop. And then we added airtime fairness. So um, by doing that, we dramatically improved the amount of bandwidth that we can get, as well as fixing the voice over IP problem. And to me, yes, VoIP is important, but to me, the one of the most important use cases for what we've just pulled off is improving uh, page load time. And the, uh, we took, during a benchmark while other stuff was happening on the link with uh, a slow station on the link, we went from a half a second to download a, a, the, the Google website, one page, to uh, 100 milliseconds. And we used the Huffington Post as one of our test scenarios. Same benchmark, bunch of stations um, uh, going full blast. We managed to have that. Um, from two seconds to one. And to me, that's a really big thing. The difference between one second and two seconds is, is a lot um, if you're clicking on stuff. So also, last but not least, the original benchmark I mentioned where we were using an original Linux Wi-Fi on the same thing, it took 35 seconds versus two versus one uh, before we made these changes to the Linux Wi-Fi stack. I'm uh, pretty happy with that, but I still have a hard time explaining it. There we go. There's another plot for you. Um, 
And this is something I believe that will apply particularly to handsets um, in the LTE and Wi-Fi world. If you apply these algorithms to it, no matter your upload rate, your latency stays flat. They go from three milliseconds to six milliseconds of induced latency, no matter if you're running at um, 40 megabits or 100 in this particular test. Uh, any other plots? This is all this other stuff from the thing here. I could go into detail as to how it works. Um, there's a paper coming out. Um, and I don't think I have anything else I can show from that. Let me, so let me go back to this. I have to say, these are some of the prettiest graphs I've seen in a long time. <laughs> now, are you talking about it being pretty in terms of the data or pretty in terms of the presentation? <laughs> Well, it's just a sheer amount of information is crammed into one graph. <laughs> um, well, that's partially the, the tool that we've developed over the last four years to look at bandwidth and latency interactions and MOS scores is awesome. We were able to compare, you know, um, let me go back to putting this plot here. Yeah, up. well, it, it, it begs the question, I mean, when you're dealing with something quite complex like that, how do you express that in an easy to understand way? And it's not easy, is it? That's why I'm here today. I mean, it's me and the monkey. <laughs> um, this is, you know, 15 different test runs aggregated together and made to look pretty, showing all the all the the, the, the median and the, and some of the outliers. Yeah. Um, well, the important thing here is that uh, we're showing how you get the latency down, isn't it? Yes. Well, at the, at the lowest amount, for example, at a megabit, your packet size is 13 milliseconds. You can't do any better than this. <laughs> As you go up, you're able to stuff more packets into it. But yeah, that, that's it shows that we did the latency curve before, though. The 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 uh, the MCS zero result was over a second. So it went from over a second to 20 milliseconds. Factor of 50. You know, you can see me dancing here. Um, the other big point, though, is by developing this tool we were able to look at thousands of plots over time as we made changes over the last two years to improve things. And we're able to go back across all that data and, um, and compare where we were. I can slice, you know, I have MCS zero results from about 20 different versions of the algorithm. And I can just compare against those. So I dearly would love it if more people use benchmarks like these to get ground truth rather than bokenism um, out of their engineering. So what was the bloat free coffee shops that I just saw? Of that? Oh, that went there. So I've <clears throat> been at the buffer bloat effort for over um, six years now, and um, it's now canon, but we were heretics originally. And seeing it get deployed, um, we had the early adopters. We had free, for example, jump all over it three months after we released the code in 2012. And we're still waiting for Comcast and a few others to even deploy their first fix. But a lot of ISPs have moved to doing it. Um, a bunch of Wi-Fi and access point uh, makers have jumped over it. So it's possible to have low latencies now in more and more places. And they don't advertise it either. I'm going to go back and put this one up. Um, I, Wait, why, why did Free, which is my ISP, why did they get involved in this? Why did they care? Because that's maybe well, the key. Well, they cared. Well, they had two things that they did right. Um, for starters, they've always built their own gear. Um, so they control, they own the whole stack. And that lets them be able to respond to changes in market conditions and theory uh, unbelievably fast. They wrote their own DSL driver. They've made a huge investment in, in controlling a network stack, much like Google has. So they were able to do so. Secondly, because they're in a competitive market, um, they needed to be able to move faster than a certain competitor or two. And they long ago, they were one of the first people groups that landed on a, a, a predecessor technology to FQ Coddle called SFQ. And that's what ships on all of their older routers. So they already knew the benefits. They already had the people. They had control of the source code. And three months after we released the new algorithms, they shipped it as part of the Revolution V6 product because everything sets. Awesome. I really wish more ISPs had more control over their stack because we'd be done now. Um, anyway, the plot that I'm showing now, 
is uh, from a place called the Pergolisi Coffee Shop in Santa Cruz, one of my favorite places in the world. They're using Cisco Meraki hardware, as well as a local ISP called Cruzio. And the collaboration between them meant that I'm sitting at the same place I did benchmarks last year, where I was experiencing hundreds of milliseconds of delay. Where I did a benchmark here, I got you know, a jittery throughput during the initial portion of the test, which is perfectly normal, and nice, solid, flat throughput, and a total amount of latency induced throughout the entire test of no more than 30 milliseconds. So there, this particular coffee shop is perfectly capable of carrying voice over IP, doing Skype, et cetera. And I'm hoping it improves their business. And it was it's just a pleasure to you sit there, drink my favorite kind of coffee, and know so a little bit of history. The Perk is one of the first coffee shops I know of that actually installed Wi-Fi. And I'm one of the people that was involved in that. And we did a deal with them. Uh, we agreed to maintain their Wi-Fi if they gave us free coffee. And it was awesome. It really was. Because uh, before that, all of us geeks were stuck in server rooms. And now we could sit outside and smoke and drink coffee, have table service. Yeah, the, those early days of Wi-Fi was a tremendously freeing experience. Anyway, uh, the Google folk long ago talked to me about all this stuff, and I knew they were rolling out uh, fixes for Buffer Blood across their st uh, Starbucks deployment. And I did go and test um, a Starbucks up in San Francisco just a couple of days ago. And uh, they don't have it quite as nailed as the PERG did, but they got it pretty nailed. Again, I could totally live with 50 milliseconds of latency. Um, induced because before uh, Google Starbucks could get unusable uh, it was in the seconds uh, before they they were still with ATT so yay the code is being deployed more widely I know it's in France and I know it's in two of my favorite coffee shops and my home where else does it need to go <laughs> uh, any more plots I don't think I got anything else let's get the plots okay so, and just going back to you, James, again, you know, to me, this plot here of, of the 100 flows working perfectly together is glorious. But I don't know how to explain it well enough to the monkey to explain it to anyone else. I think the way you explain it is you compare it with the bad one. And you say, look, it, it, this is, a, yeah, that's the bad one, where it just kind of ramps up a bit and it's a bit all, all over the place and then it goes, Bleh and dies. Okay. Um, that's clearly a bad one. There's not a lot going on there. And you compare that with the good one and say, look at what we're pushing through this pipe. Hmm. And you see it's a lot busier. Um, so clearly it's, it, it's much more effective at getting stuff through the, through the pipe. So the, the, the one to look at on that is that you have to feel super sorry for the, well, I mean, obviously you feel sorry for the people who don't even get started, but you feel kind of sorry for the, 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 the green guy because like basically they have to wait until for nothing to happen and then finally at the end they actually get some bits through like so it's almost like they've had to wait in the queue before oh you mean the the, the lime green as opposed to the yeah. Dark green yeah yeah the lime green guy does not get started until 120 seconds after he clicked on do something right yeah so so that that's that's the the you know that's the way i would approach it, uh, explaining it it's just saying like you know Imagine you're the green guy. <laughs> okay, imagine you're the green guy. It's tough being green, isn't it? Well, a lime green, I can imagine, would be pretty dreadful, actually. Yeah. It's actually a title of a book by, a series of books by, and now I'm fighting to remember the name of the guy. It's also a t title of a TV series over here. Oh, really? It's Hard yeah. to be Green? Yeah. Really? Oh, I, I thought we were all quoting Kermit the Frog, um, but... <laughs> it's not easy to do. Yeah, yeah you're nice. showing your rings. <laughs> um, so, uh, so in summary, um, there's going to be a paper on this, but the code has been uh, most of the foundational code is now in Linux 4.9, which will be out soon. The rest of it will be most of the rest of it. We hope will be in 4.10. It only works well on one chipset, the F 9K. There's work going on on the F 10K. These are both Qualcomm products as well as the MT72, which is a MediaTek product. Um, and it helps a lot on clients. 
uh, but the principal target is making access points a ton better. Mm. And as a result, this will be in the OpenWRT and Lee distributions. It's mostly as already, so you can reflash any of a few hundred different routers and get all this chocolatey goodness to play with. Yummy, um, yummy. <laughs> I was going to say it would be be interesting to have some um, kind of hardware re um, recommendations, like you know, uh, like of okay. all the stuff sitting on my desk. Is uh, am I capable of running this as a access point on any of this stuff? Like I don't know. Um, At the stuff on your desk, if um, ideally what I do is I'd go to the OpenWRT website and I would look for the brand and the chipset. Right. Um, it's Qu Qualcomm Atheros is the basic manufacturer and AR71X is a common one. Hopefully you'll find it, but I'll, I'll give you that we, we use all, we're using everybody else's hardware, just repurpose. This is just new software. There's no new hardware needed, right. just better queuing theory. Um, so the top five devices that we have been using um, were the Netgear Wonder 3800s. These are getting hard to get, but they were a premium router at your time. People are buying them for extra money off of eBay because they're so solid. We use those a lot. Um, the TP-Link Archer C7 V2 um, is also pretty good. It's helpful in that it has an Ath9K and an Ath10K in it. Uh, CPU is a little weak to drive the Ath10K, but it's usable and they're cheap. The uh, the hottest platform that I'm using to repurpose these days, I'm, I probably have one around here, is from Ubiquity. Uh, it's called the UBNT UAP Lite. They take a reflash of, of OpenWRT or LEAD, that's what we're using, LEAD, um, in a split second, and then boom, you're done. Um, and they're cool in that they're, um, we're seeing this sort of satellite mode for uh, Wi-Fi. So if you want to distribute Wi-Fi throughout your home, you get a couple of these kind of things. They have one Ethernet port. They're eighty dollars, I think, and you just put them wherever your signal strength is poor, and boom, you're done. Um, it's a similar model that Eero and OnHub, etc., is doing, except we're using custom software. Um, the two latest and greatest. There's two higher end platforms we're looking at. Um, in particular, the Taurus Omnia is the world's first truly open source, open WRT router developed by a bunch of guys that care. How do you spell yeah. that? Taurus, T-U-R-R-I-S space Omnia. Yeah, I've seen um, a lot of buzz on that. Everybody's waiting for it and they're just starting to ship. Is that right? Yes, they're just starting to ship. Um, they had a good Kickstarter. They raised like three times the amount of money they thought they were going to get. And um, they're actually funded by a DNS registrar, a place that's really tired of DDoSs. And they wanted to build a better home router. And, yeah, I think and, they and they're in, in the Czech Republic. That's correct. And somebody uh, would kindly put that into the IRC channel and we'll. Yeah, it's coming. It's it coming. It's coming. Yeah. And we'll okay. try to put it on the blog post. Yeah. So, yeah, I've um, seen a lot about that, Dave. Well, they have focused on stability. I mean, uh, they're just shipping. They're promising, among other things, long-term support and upgrades, which is really important these days. Um, I like what they're doing a lot, and I'm rooting for them. All that said, I'd get one. I'd play with it first before putting it into production. You know, <laughs> first 1.0 of the hard software and hardware question that I asked uh, people in my uh, circle on uh, wire because uh, you need to get on wire by the way Dave wire.com anyway uh, the question was okay those of us who have set top, okay I've got free and so it's a set top box basically the wire it's all comes into this one revolution um, box now you can put these things in bridge mode I have no idea the susceptibility of attack go ahead you were gonna say um, there's two things. Um, the free folk are aware that this is a software upgrade. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm kind of hoping they also fix, they improve their Wi-Fi and the Revolution V6. Okay. Um, okay. I was referring to this problem of... Uh, of DDoS, you know, et cetera. Of DDoS. But, the, but my, anyway, back to people who are not free, maybe, is that you've got a set-top box, or you've got your provider who gave you the modem, but you can, most modems can be put into bridge mode, in which case 
you could get one of these routers, right? I mean, that that's my question. Is it, what, what does the average person do who's maybe a little above average because they know about what we're yeah. talking about, but, you know. Now, you do have to be a little above average, unfortunately. I'm, I'm really hating um, the all-in-one routers provided by everybody. The ISPs yeah. don't know, generally don't know how to make hardware. And although they're learning, but I immediately take every device I get I put it into bridge mode. I put software that I trust on it that will be updated on a different box, and and that's it. I I really wish the ISPs would get out of the business or at least delegate it to someone that knew what they were doing. Um, so that's sort of bridge mode. Use your own firewall. Use your own code. If you're a good hacker, if you if you if you're not a good hacker, I, if you yes, if you're a good hacker, do it. It's always been my hope, though, that reflashing a router has become very easy. You click on update firmware, you put your firmware on it, you then upload it, you configure a couple things, and you're done. Um, so it's always been my hope that more people, instead of throwing away crappy devices, would actually just repurpose them with better software. This is one of the big problems. And the other one, as uh, Tim would certainly acknowledge, <laughs> because, you know, Internet of Things... Uh, look, I don't know how to say this other than we're fricked. I don't know what to say, you know. I mean, there's no good solution out of this. Oh, yes, so, there is. Yes, there is? Yeah, I'm working on it. Okay. <laughs> and that would be... We, what's the URL? The in the middle of the Pacific. Yeah, Pipe Dream. Pipe Dream. <laughs> <laughs> Pipedream.io. Uh, no, let, let me no, before we no. before we go to our <laughs> okay before we go to our mature audiences uh, mode here, let's get Dave. Um, what is the best URL for people to see uh, to contact you or to see what you're doing or you know um, anything you want just to, to keep it clear? What what's the best place to contact you or to see what you're out to? Well, the overall project is called the Buffer Bloat Project, bufferbloat.net, and off of that are links to things like Make Wi-Fi Fast, which is the project I've been talking about today. Okay. And uh, Dave would be somebody who could we could call friend of the show if this was a show. <laughs> so, yeah. Thank you so much, Dave. It's yeah, always Dave, a pleasure. Question. All right, wait a minute, James. I just want to thank James, thank Dave, and then turn it over to James for his final question. <laughs> Dave, has somebody given you a doctorate yet? Because you deserve one. Thank you very much. I would like. I would. I would really like that. <laughs> we have uh, because because the the level of detail and the passion with which you you've gone into this this subject area easily warrants half a dozen uh, phds i reckon so so no we, ought, we ought to find a, a university somewhere who will give you an honorary doctorate then you can be dr dave and have a funny hat <laughs> and i want to officially invite dave to come out of your world in berlin and we'll make let us make that happen everyone who is hearing my words today let's ha make that happen Okay. Actually, yes, you'd have a lot of fun, um, and, the, and the Fraunhofer guys would be interested, and good crowd. In fact, you could probably come and visit the uh, the Wi-Fi disaster I was discuss discussing earlier. Um, so, uh, so yeah, no, you should cool. definitely come to Berlin for Camarillo Cam World. I uh, I will try to make it this year, and if you want right. to close the show up, we'll do the Google BBR thing uh, some other time. I'm cool with no, <laughs> not that we ran out of time, but uh, we will do it another time. Okay, okay, everybody, thank you all. Next week we have you know mo. Is that it? You know me. You know me. You know, you know me, me, Michael. Yeah. Right. And that's going to be quite good, I think. Uh, it will always, always as good as Dave down. and his bloaty thing. Well, nothing's as good as Dave and his bloaty thing. Okay. But Let's leave bloody, it at that. Bloody McBloat face. <laughs> <laughs> All right, folks. See you next week. Thank you. This is the end of the broadcast and time for the mature audiences only version. <laughs>